who do you think is more influential and powerful in Washington, D.C., the lobbyists or the intelligence agencies? Well, I mean, the answer to the question is yes, they're one and the same. Because, because, because <laughs> yeah. often, oftentimes they are fused with precisely the same personnel, where people will roll out of DOJ and end up at you know, the law firm that services the lobby corps and, and the very same clients. I mean, there's no better example of the fusion of that than when I learned through a whistleblower that the, the Perkins Cooey law firm, which is the legal wing of the Democratic Party, yeah. party has within it a secure information facility that is run by the FBI. So they, they literally have a place in their law firm where they can try to convert political dirt into intelligence investigations, counterintelligence investigations, criminal investigations, and the like. Yeah, and can let's you, not forget all the Epstein and tapes. And it's up and running today. Too. Yeah, it's yeah. up and running today. And they have all the Epstein tapes too, but that's another thing. Do you have any hope in the Jim Jordan uh, new committee when it comes to investigating the weaponization of government? Do you think that's going to be akin to maybe a church committee? Yeah, that, that's our objective. And the specific agreement we have with McCarthy is that that select committee will have the budget, resources, personnel, no less than the Democrats' <laughs> January 6th committee. Well, what do you think? Do you think it'll work out? Uh, look, I, it's hard to promise outcomes when we don't have the ability to throw handcuffs on anybody or put anybody in jail, right? All we can do is expose facts. And so it relies on other features of our system to kind of go end to end on that accountability. And so I don't wanna promise people like, yeah, you know, you're gonna see Hunter Biden hauled off in cuffs. You're gonna see the Joe Biden, University of Penn, like China money laundering stuff and, you know, because that may be out there, but it may not result in precisely what people would hope upon, upon encountering the information. Ian, do you want to ask about, you made that point about sometimes no investigation is better than an investigation. Oh, yeah. Especially like with the NIST investigation for 9-11. I mean, there's so many holes in that thing if you look at it objectively. Well, like, I'm concerned that they would put forth an investigation, but it ends up being a sham. And then they're like, okay, we did it. Our investigation's over, everyone. We didn't find anything. Don't ask again. As well, opposed to no investigation. And then This is the Saudis' playbook, right? I mean, you know, the Saudis were able to avoid the responsibility uh, that they have in the 9-11 attacks and in a terrorist attack in my district in Pensacola because they get a nice little report written that, you know, is sufficient to absolve them. And then they say, oh, well, not like not nothing to see here. You don't need to come back and conduct any further inquiry. Do you fear or, or is that concern when when creating committees of I don't know, because I'm like, well, we need an independent committee, but who's deciding who's on the independent committee? Like, how do you ensure that it isn't a sham? Personnel. I mean, that, that's why we know that the people who will be on that committee will be people like Jim Jordan, Chip Roy, Thomas Massey, people who actually ask tough questions. What is the point? What is the goal exactly? Like, are there specific um, directions that you guys are aiming at thus far? Have you decided like what, what I don't know, departments are going to be investigated or what is, are specific things being looked for? <laughs> yeah, you heard McCarthy in his uh, speech single out the FBI, right? He did not talk about like a weaponized government in the abstract. When he spoke, he spoke specifically about politics at the FBI. So one of our first areas of inquiry is going to be this Timothy Tebalt guy who suppressed information that was derogatory to the Bidens and did not allow the normal process of criminal inquiry to continue there. And, and they do everything they can at the FBI to try to supercharge anything that is related to Trump or anyone around Trump or anybody who's on the right. And then if it's the Bidens, they, they function as um, their defender and they suppress the derogatory information. So that'd probably be where we start. I, I wonder how it is that, you know, Trump being a wealthy <clears throat> elite and all that stuff still ends up outside the big club that you know, Joe Biden seems to get away with everything, but Donald Trump is the target of everything. Do you think that it's it's a function of elitism or do you think it's a function of, uh, of like Joe, Joe Biden just being of the system? Right. I mean, he's uh, he is of this place. Uh, he chaired, you know, foreign affairs in the Senate where you interact with a lot of the people who end up in powerful positions in the intelligence community. And Trump went in with a goal of reorganizing that and, and changing it and 
that's, I think, why they kick back at him so hard. What I don't understand, though, is if Trump or let's say Joe Biden is part of the liberal economic order that's, you know, we're evolving to a new world order. They say George Bush Sr. said that. Klaus Schwab's intimated that. Lots of people around the world are realizing we're globalizing. A new world order where it's not about American military bases everywhere anymore. Now we're going to have a new type of thing. But in that instance, I would think that the Americans would want the Russians on their side, not siding with China and the Chinese economic order. I don't understand why... Why are people pushing Russia away if they're trying to create a new world? It's going to make Amer- I'm concerned it would make America number three. Well, I mean, what we're seeing right now is the leverage buyout of Russia from uh, with a lot of Chinese cash. I mean, there there are more Chinese with two million dollars cash in their bank account right now, like U.S. US uh, equivalent, than there are total Canadians. And so, wow. you know, yeah, you're you're seeing uh, a lot of the farmland. You know, in Russia, um, get just bought out by the Chinese, and it it, it fuses it's, it's true here, though, those it? systems in a way that poses a real substantial threat to the United States, to the West at large. Aren't they buying our farmland as well? Yeah, I thought that <laughs> maybe colonized. Maybe we could propose some sort of peace deal between Russia and Ukraine because the, what they're doing it looks like Putin's trying to take a land bridge to Crimea so that he has warm water access into the Black Sea. Russia, basically after the Soviet Union split up, they they took it all away from Russia and they gave um, they gave it to to Ukraine. That city, what's the big city there right on the right on the in Crimea? And I think what 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 we need to do is establish I don't think Russia's ever going to stop until they get a land bridge into Crimea and a warm water seaport. So has that come up in Congress that you guys are like can we de- I've got a pretty a piece- cynical view on the, you know, Russia Ukraine conflict. Yeah. I uh, have been voting against sending more weapons there. Hold on, let me get this cough drop. In. Yeah, dog. I'll give you guys. A- well, the geopolitical situation, uh, especially <laughs> you between got an extra one that's happening right now, and you get yeah. A lot of people in the comment section are saying that this is cough cast. It's cough cast. Uh, Sorry, unfolding man. right now. I think I'm the only one. Well, I'm not coughing. Me and Ian, I just lost my voice. Me and Ian are the only ones holding holding on here. But it is a very complex uh, geopolitical situation that I think represents the larger proxy war between the East and the West. Um, I, I think sending in more weapons prolongs this proxy conflict to make sure that, of course, it goes on forever. I think this war is meant to be continued and not won. There's also a lot of debates now about tanks. Uh, to me, do you think there's a possibility for any kind of peace deal? Because I think it's getting um, co-opted so many times, including by individuals like Boris Johnson that literally go to you. Ukraine and say, no, you're not going to even sit at the table here with the Russians. Do you think one year from now, 10 years from now, there's some kind of possibility for peace here? Or is this just going to be a well, who makes money on a forever? peace deal? That's true. Yep. Right. I mean, peace is not nearly as profitable to those who are in the war business. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, so obviously I have to say it out loud. I mean, to me, our involvement in Ukraine is directly linked to our diminished involvement in Afghanistan. Like Afghanistan was the money laundering capital of the world for like a lot of our lifetime. A lot of that cash was like run through Dubai and, you know, Abu Dhabi. And when that was not the corrupt country that we just decided to pour American cash on, like we needed another historically corrupt country to go pour American military material and cash into and gain of function and, research and, too. And UK, Ukraine fit the bill, and so I don't believe that like anyone's really working toward peace. I think that there are very powerful interests that benefit if this is a long term, low yield war. Yes, yeah, C- CNN but, is even reporting right now that the United States is running low on some weapons and ammunition because they're transferring so much of it to Ukraine right now. So that's that's staggering and also dangerous for the United States to be in such a vulnerable spot as well. So uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot of bigger interests here. BlackRock just signed a deal with Ukraine that they're going to be rebuilding Ukraine as, of course, BlackRock also has a lot of deals funding uh, and being a part of the military industrial complex. There, you see the circle of life they're kind of involving there. Is there any way to kind of address this? Is there anything that we could do as people to bring awareness to this? Is there any way there could be some kind of peace here? Well, the trend lines are coming in my direction when it comes to public perception on this. I mean, initially, like the American people were dying to send every American dollar, you know, to Ukraine. And increasingly, at least within the Republican Party, you've started to see that shift as our economic conditions are more in the forefront of people's minds. Like, we have laws that require end-to-end monitoring of materiel when we send it into a war zone. And 
I am not convinced we are following them. Is it because we're not technically at war? The United States hasn't been technically at a war since World War II. Well, in a we do have regs that define a conflict zone, and whenever we send stuff that kills into one of those places, we're supposed to know who has it. Thanks for watching this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. and become a member over at Timcast.com for uncensored members-only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.